What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guests in this episode of Hidden Forces are Michael Anderson and Vance Spencer. Mike and Vance are the founders of Framework Ventures, a crypto native venture capital firm with a team of technologists, researchers, and investors that actively build alongside the companies and protocols in which they invest. They were on the podcast about two years ago to discuss their thesis on the opportunities in decentralized finance, and they're back on today to talk about blockchain gaming, their latest big bet on the future of the crypto industry. I'm a big fan of these guys. They're thoughtful, they're passionate, and they're native. They've grown up in this space, and their investment philosophy and framework reflect that. Besides discussing the opportunities in gaming, Michael and Vance also share elements of their approach to investing, how they source deals and outcompete legacy venture funds with deep pockets and big brand names in an industry that is long on capital, but short on know-how. The type of know-how that comes with complementary connections across projects and protocols and a deep industry knowledge derived from active participation running nodes, staking assets, providing security reviews, building tools, and participating in network governance. My objective in bringing you this conversation is to give you a roadmap for thinking about how to invest in what can often feel like an intimidating and rapidly changing space that remains positioned to produce some of the biggest value generating opportunities in software and some of the most rewarding opportunities for collaboration and online experiences. Before we start, I wanna encourage all of you, if you value these types of discussions, to share the podcast with your coworkers, friends, and family. I don't rely on sponsors or advertisers, so the second part of our episodes are available to premium subscribers only who make the production of this podcast possible. You can access the entire conversation as well as the transcripts and intelligence reports to each episode by visiting our website at hiddenforces.io, selecting the episode that you're interested in and clicking on the premium extras, where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. Since some of this episode deals with investing, it should be absolutely clear that nothing we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode with my guests, Michael Anderson and Vance Spencer. Vance Spencer and Michael Anderson, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be back. It's awesome having you guys back. Where are you guys? I know that Michael's the new office in Palo Alto. Where is the office located, Michael? It's in Jackson Square in San Francisco. Okay. And what about you, Vance? Where are you located? I'm just in Los Angeles for a couple of days, but headed back to HQ pretty soon. I was going to say, it looks like you're back to living at home. (laughs) It's my dad's birthday, so I'm hanging out with him for a couple of days. All right. So I have tons of questions for you guys, obviously, but why don't you tell me? I know I know a lot has changed since we last spoke, and I should let listeners know you guys were on the show about two years ago. We were in the thick of DeFi summer, and you guys were one of the earliest, if not the earliest, venture fund in the space to invest in DeFi and in some of the core technology like Chainlink very early. And that was a really enlightening conversation that we had about DeFi, about the prospects in the industry. We talked about Chainlink, if I recall. For sure, we talked about Chainlink. I think we also discussed synthetics and some other protocols. But we also talked about the importance of community, your investment approach. And at that time, I think you had just launched or were about to launch your um, Framework Labs initiative. So what's new? A lot, honestly. I mean, you kind of interviewed us close to the beginning of Framework, which is, it's interesting to look back and, and listen to that podcast, you know, two two years later. And, and Framework as a concept is about three and a half years old. But really, you know, we went from this firm that was focused exclusively on DeFi and middleware and, and specifically leading those rounds to kind of building out this lab side. And, you know, today we manage about $1.4 billion and labs has its own nine-figure balance sheet. But at the beginning and around the time you talked to us, it was you know the nights of the kitchen table and, and Michael and I with with a ledger trying to figure out how to build this organization and scale it. But 
you know, we've been able to lead and win deals. We've kind of grown as the industry has, has matured as well. And, you know, the things that we were doing back then have led us to, you know, basically focus on more mainstream use cases, gaming, content, and commerce. And, you know, we've raised almost half a billion dollars since as well. We've gotten a new office. We have 22 employees. Our perspective is effectively that crypto is going to allow us to leapfrog the incumbents in our industry, which is venture, just like our portfolio companies are doing to fintech and, and games and commerce. And so that's where we are, you know, today. But, you know, Michael, what did I miss? <laughs> a lot has changed. Really, I think we started with this thesis that we dubbed kind of internally, we called it network capital from the start, which was being a, an active participant in the investments that we make at a level that you just didn't see from traditional venture firms. And we've held that thesis the entire time. We talked about labs last time we were on the show, but in reality, we started framework with labs simultaneously, but we started to scale it when we were on the show last. And really, we've just continued to scale. And so I think not much has changed, but then again, a lot has changed. And yeah, excited to, to come here and, and talk about the realization of the vision that we had three years ago. Remind me what framework labs is, and then tell me about your network capital thesis, both of which... I believe we talked about last time, but for people that haven't heard that episode or don't remember, it would be good to get a refresher. Yeah. So Framework Labs is really just a sidecar company to a venture fund. And we kind of all call it framework and it's all under the same umbrella. We just have different you know, entity structures for the different initiatives that we're doing and the different capital that we're able to raise. And so we have subsequent venture funds, as you'd see within a traditional venture firm. But Framework Labs is really sort of the heart of what we do. And it's 22 employees at this point. Most of the people that work at Framework Ventures are engineers. And you know we have a, a number of investors as well and a number of people on other initiatives. But really what we're doing within Framework Labs is we're actually actively participating through software, through tooling, and through engagement on chain. We're one of the larger consumers of financial services on chain through DeFi services. We're one of the larger infrastructure providers for some of the networks that we invested in, like Chainlink and The Graph. And we are actively participating in some of the new initiatives that are not DeFi, so gaming, content, commerce, as Vance alluded to. You know, We're looking at different ways that software can give us an edge to be able to participate either pre-investment or, or post-investment investment to help the success of the venture funds. And labs just, you know, more specifically, I think Michael's being a bit modest, you know, if, if you've used crypto in the past few years, there's a very strong chance that you've interacted with us at some level. And that's the point. We want to kind of be everywhere and we want to have leverage over the ecosystem just by virtue of being on chain and, and being active. And so there's that part, but there's also the part where, you know, labs is able to connect our portfolio companies together. You know, Chainlink is the Oracle provider and, and we're the node runner on those networks to provide price feeds for most of our portfolio companies. The graph is the main service, which services all the front ends for our portfolio companies. When you have these things that are effectively just smart contracts on chain, you know, which are portfolio companies, they can leverage each other's APIs just by calling the functions that exist on chain. And, and that creates this kind of weird, but very strong, reflexive combinatorial effect that you know, if you have this central coordinating entity like labs, you can really spin the flywheel in a way that you know isn't really possible in, in traditional venture. Okay, so flesh out for me how that relates to this concept of network capital. The concept of network capital is effectively that, you know, when our web two VC and you you know back a, a social media company, you're giving them capital, you're gonna go sit on the board, maybe. And you know, as the business scales and develops, you know, you probably put more people on the board until you hand them over to a larger group of stakeholders. But your interaction with the company and what they do is is pretty limited. For us, you know, everything is built on chain, everything is open source, everything we're able to interact with or use in some way. And so if you're a, a money market, we'll be your largest borrower. If you're a derivatives market, we'll be your largest trader. If you're a game, you know, we'll actually plug in one of our guilds into your games so that you have a ton of players. And this is kind of the combinatorial effect that I was referencing where, you know, through virtue of software and, and also just having a large balance sheet on the lab side, we can use this as, as a weapon and we can help dictate the outcome of our portfolio companies just by using them. And, there, and there's no moats in Web3. There is no, you know, IP. There is no, you know, anything being held close to the chest that you're not letting competitors have. Everything is open source. And so it's more about the flywheel and getting that spinning quickly than it is about any core defensibility. And, and that's what Labs is known for. And that's why we can win deals. You know, compare us to a traditional Web2 VC who's just going to sit on the sidelines. We're just going to add so much more value through 
auditing your smart contracts, using your protocols, connecting you to your customers and other upstream you know, suppliers that you need. And that's really the power of network capital. And, and the flywheel, when it spins, can be extremely powerful when labs is earning staking rewards, the fund is doing the venture investing, and you're just creating a lot of value from, from really just a starting point. So this is really interesting because we did an episode with Sebastian Malaby, who wrote a book called The Power Law, and it was on venture capital. And it was a fascinating history. It is a fascinating history of the various players in the venture space, how they came to be, their modus operandi, what informed that, what informed their competitive edge. And one of the trends that we saw in venture over the decades, since really, I guess, Fairchild Semiconductor, but even before that, up in Boston, was capital became, over time, easier to source. Like in the early days, it was right there in the name, venture capital. And it was an integral part of what made it possible for these firms to go out and start businesses. Today, that's become in crypto. I mean, it's the perfect example where not only is capital abundant, generally speaking, in the economy or has been, but also the, the sort of crowdfunding model that's inherent in crypto makes it so that projects have been able to self-fund from day one. So I'm curious to understand from your perspective, one, how that from the earliest days impacted the value proposition of an outside investor like you guys, and two, how that has in practice influenced the types of venture firms and investors that have been successful in the space and how the legacy firms that have been on the sidelines, let's say from the early days, have tried to come in and what value they've been able to provide. Help me understand that whole culture as it's evolved. So one of the things that we think back to, and, and this is a little bit of ex post facto rationalization that we didn't realize we were stepping into with the concept of network capital and, and ventures plus labs. In looking back at some of the, the notable venture firms like Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia, they both implemented very similar strategies at different eras of their development. And Don Valentine from Sequoia talks about how, you know, because he saw what was going on with the personal computer revolution, investing in Apple in, in the 70s and seeing what that potential could drive, that led to a number of investments in software companies. And he used to say that he was able to see the future because he saw the potential of what the PC could do. And then it was just a roadmap of how to go and solve all the different pain points that you would see. And in the 90s, you know, Kleiner Perkins had this concept, a Japanese concept called Kiratsu, which basically meant that everybody was working together. You know, the business development deals that were being struck by the different portfolio companies, they were all working together. They were collaborating together. You know, they were meeting up every year at summits together. And those two concepts simultaneously is is a lot of what we're doing. You know, as Vance alluded to, you know, it's chain link that led us to synthetics. It's the graph that led us to basically all the different DeFi protocols that were getting any type of scale because they were the ones that were using the graph the most. And so it's it's these singular investments that ultimately end up becoming the networked investments that we use to build intuition around and, and we use to be able to build understanding around. But it's also the participation of labs. And, and so we're not only able to see this stuff probably ahead of time because we're closest to the metal, but we're also able to dictate you know, the outcomes in a lot of these things because we have that, that extra oomph with labs to be able to participate at a different level and, and differentiated level. And you're exactly right. Capital is a commodity at this point. It's never been easier to raise money. I'd say it's also never, be able to, never been harder to break out with a fund. And so what we're able to do, and, and you know, this fund was you know, oversubscribed, and, and we probably could have raised more if we wanted to, but, but really, you know, your fund size does dictate your investment strategy. And our investment strategy is to be early stage, you know, leading the seed, leading the Series A rounds of these different protocols, networks, and companies, and to be participatory at a level that allows us to have a concentrated portfolio where we're not just spraying and praying, and, and we're really doubling and tripling down on, on the ones that are working, but also really partnering with the founding team that we decide to back. And so I think altogether, that's just a differentiated model, especially when you compare it to any you know, Sand Hill Road VC that's trying to come into Web3 now. So that's a great, and I want to let you jump in as well, Vance, if you have a comment, but that's a, a great observation or comparison between yourselves today and Kleiner Perkins and the early personal computer market. One of the main differences that sticks out for me is that obviously there is the comparison that you could by being an early investor in certain key components of that industry, you could be on the boards and you could influence, for example, the direction of those companies in ways that are similar to when you're participating in network governance today. 
but you didn't have the ability to run a node. There was nothing equivalent back then. So do you think that it gives you even more of an edge now? You get even more embedded and it's even more important to startups in the space? And tack on that a follow-up question, which is, what do founders tell you is important to them? What are they looking for? Are they even aware that these are the things they need? Or do you need to educate most of the people that you come across about why they need you? The first thing is that we have a track record of winning in an area that needs you know, a lot of hand-holding if you're new to it. How do you set up a DAO? How do you launch a token? How do you set up, you know, like which markets are you going to go after? Do you want to build something vertical in DeFi or, you know, something more horizontal that leverages all these primitives? There's a lot of, you know, dark area on the map that, frankly, if you go to a traditional venture firm, they're just not going to be able to point out where you should probably think about or, or where you should go. And I think that's, you know, the first thing that people come to us for is just, you know, we have a, a really good mental map because we've done. 75 deals and we've led 80% of these deals. We're not we're not just a firm that's putting together follow on allocation and you know that's our business like we're we're making bold decisive bets where we're the largest holder of tokens outside the company and and there's a market for that in crypto and there's a market with a specific type of founder that want to work with us specifically not only because of our ability to just give them playbooks and and guide them but also setting up infrastructure, being your largest customer, being one of your largest governance participants, those are things that funds you know, in the traditional space just frankly cannot do. And they know the value of that. The other thing I'll say, and, and just to kind of come back to Michael's point about John Doerr, you know, at that point in Kleiner Perkins, you know, he was extremely involved. He very, you know, tenacious, aggressive, hungry person. And today what's happening is that you know, the John Doors of these venture firms are kind of going through this generational change, coincidentally at the same time that Web3 happens to be really scaling and becoming interesting. And so a lot of these traditional venture firms are both trying to manage, how do I figure out generational change? How do I pass the baton to the next generation of people that are going to run this firm? But also, you know, how do we go off and tackle Web3? And, you know, it's not about firm to firm, like us versus Sequoia, I really don't ever think about it that way. I think it's GP to GP. And a lot of the GPs at these you know, other funds have very interesting, rich, diverse lives. You know, Michael and I, all we do is crypto and we are together about 16 hours a day. And so that is kind of the difference. And it's hard to express, but we're just ingrained in the culture. We have a good corner of, of this you know, to ourselves and, and people want to be around, you know, frankly, people that are winning in crypto. That's an interesting comparison about handing off the baton. I guess it's a really great point because that's hard enough as it is, but if the baton that you're handing over isn't what it used to be or it doesn't work the way that it used to work or doesn't isn't as relevant, how do you manage that? That's an interesting thing to think about. So let's go back to what you were talking about before that, which was founders coming to you and what you guys are able to offer. Help me understand, give me some examples. You don't have to name names. What's an example of a founder coming to you where he or she actually has something that's unique and valuable that you want to invest in, but where he or she doesn't understand certain fundamental facts about the industry that they need in order to be successful. So I think it's less about them, the founders, not understanding the different things that they need to be successful, because most of the people that that we're backing are also Web3 native, just like ourselves. And so, you know, one of the things that we evaluate and one of the points of conversation that we have with everyone that we meet with is, you know, what's your history of Web3, you know, personally? And how deep are you? You know, what communities have you been a part of? You know, what were you doing in summer 2020 when DeFi summer was happening? And, you know, how is it that you're thinking about building this, growing this? And, you know, how can we participate as well? And so it's less about, hey, I don't have really have any idea what to do. It's more, I know exactly what you guys do and I know what you can contribute. And that's exactly what I need. And so I think it's a lot more about alignment of perspective as opposed to you know someone who has a brand and, and capital and, and check writing ability and who's going to you know be able to to help on that front, but not necessarily on anything post investment. And and so that's what I would say is most of the conversation. So when you guys started off, you had to source deals. How much has that changed today, given the fact that your your reputation has grown? Walk me through how that works today. How do you find opportunities to invest in? And then let's talk about how you evaluate them. 
Yeah, I mean, when we were starting, we were basically asking people to take chances on us. And we started with the idea that we were only going to lead rounds and we weren't going to come off that. And, you know, as long as we could establish a position of leading one company's round, like we could do the next 100. We just needed to get there. And so a lot of it early was just people taking chances on us, you know, people like Stanny, people like Kane, people like Sergey. And, you know, we repaid that by just being good stewards of their network. And, you know, we've talked about just the track record of winning and just the portfolio of services that we provide. But, you know, now we have just frankly a ton of really strong inbound that's referenced, you know, by our network. And, you know, we see probably, you know, two, 3,000 deals a year. And, you know, we, we're doing, you know, a fraction of a percentage of those when we actually pull the trigger. But really the key thing that we've had to transition is, you know, just being focused on DeFi and middleware to being focused on games, to having, you know, a cross-chain perspective to, you know, thinking about where the infrastructure nets out long-term. And there's certain categories that we stay away from. We don't really do base layers. You know, we, we think that at the longer term horizon, you know, the application layer accrues more value. And so right now that's where we're most focused is, you know, half of our fund, 200 million is going to be focused on blockchain gaming. And we can talk a, a little bit about the thesis why, and that's a very different market than we've historically played in. But I think what Michael and I are really good at is just being able to get up to speed extremely quickly, meeting people and and just you know flying out, getting next to people, and really whatever it takes to win, we'll do. Okay, so a bunch of things that I'm interested in talking about because I do want to make sure that we talk a little bit more about your process because I'm interested in that as well. So let me just say, application layer value versus base layer. I want to talk about that because that gets us to a conversation about tokenomics, which I think for a lot of outsiders is one of the least appreciated parts of the space and maybe one of the least developed theoretically. But you guys can tell me if you agree or disagree with that. Let's go back to this evolution because you guys have only been around for what, three years or something, which is absolutely Three years bonkers. officially. We, we have, we, I think we could extend it like four informally, but like, let's call it three. Uh, well, anyway, that's like when you're a kid and you're yeah. like, I'm three and a half or I'm three and three fourths. <laughs> yep. You know what I mean? That just shows you how young you guys are, institutionally speaking. So what's also interesting for me is thinking about the skill set that you need to invest successfully when you're actively sourcing deals versus when deals are coming to you. Certainly when deals are coming to you, you can get more efficient, you can reduce all the work that goes into actually sourcing deals, but then you have a problem of inbound and sorting through all the crap. Whereas if you're going out, you're using a different skill set. I'm curious how you found that adjustment process and what the pros and cons are of it and uh, and how your, your process changed as a result of the fact that you have all these people coming to you now and you need to be able to use maybe a different set of heuristics to figure out who you should and who you shouldn't accept to even look at their stuff because you can't even look at everybody's stuff. So I think one thing to clarify, we're still pounding the pavement. You know, nothing has stopped in terms of us going off and, and trying to find new opportunities. It has changed quite a bit in that, you know, we're, we're taking warm leads from other founders that we've backed or other people that we know in the space. But the other thing that's happened and going back to, you know, 2019, when we uh, kicked things off with framework, the industry was a fraction of the size that it is today. And you could go to a conference and, and know most of the people there, you just recognize their face, you recognize their voice from podcasts, and, and there just weren't that many people in the space. So there weren't that many opportunities. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why we've had this growth trajectory that we've had over the last few years is because the industry has also had that growth trajectory. And so as the industry has matured, it, it really has changed from us, you know, being able to just go walk through a conference hall and, and say hi to everybody to, you know, having to have an inbound filter of, you know, leads or, or opportunities or people to meet. And, and so, you know, the team has grown because of that, because we need more people to help handle, you know, all the inbound, but also the evaluation process and getting out into all the different disparate ecosystems. And that really, I think, is one of the things that's helped us scale is, you know, building the right team around you to go focus on different categories, different areas, different ecosystems. You know, that's just enabled us to scale our time as well. But to go back to your original question on heuristics, you know, probably the number one success criteria that we can point to for any investment that we've made is you know, how maniacally competitive is the founding team or the founder? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to because everything else is superfluous. You know, you, the team that you recruit, it's going to be based around, you know, how you view what you need and, and frankly, the things that you don't have that you need. And then how you think about go to market, how do you think about product design? How do you think about launch strategy? How do you think about community development? You know, all those things kind of originate back to this concept of does the founder want to win? 
And if they do, they'll be able to figure it out. And so, you know, there's a ton of other attributes that we can talk through, but I think, frankly, you know, the number one thing is competitiveness. So love that. Just for listeners, as a reminder, one of my favorite episodes all time was my conversation with Tim Grover, who was Michael Jordan's strength coach from the day they won their first championship. And so much of that's about competition. The book that Tim wrote, I think he's written maybe two, or maybe this was his first book, but it was literally called Winning. There's a lot to be said about being competitive. And that, of course, obviously comes with tons of ego issues as well. You have to work through. What does that look like hitting the pavement for guys like you? Walk me through what that means. Like, does hitting the pavement involve some Google searches at 2 a.m. in the morning? Like, what is hitting the pavement in crypto? I mean, a good example of this is, you know, we backed Alluvium in January 2021, and, and that was kind of- What is it, for those who aren't familiar with crypto, what is a, what is Alluvium? Because all these different projects have all these names that sound like they're from the Roman Republic or some sci-fi outer space world. Alluvium is a- game that is built on chain. The CEO, his name is, is Kieran. It's kind of this concept where if you're dropped on a planet, you need to kind of re-terraform and, and you know, mold the planet back to health. And in the process, you're discovering characters called alluvials, which are effectively kind of like new age versions of Pokemon. But the thing about this game is that all of the characters, all of the land, all of the items are NFTs, all of the, you know, fungible tokens that you can earn are on chain. And it's not really a company even. There is no bank account. There is no foundation. It's simply a large DAO with a multi-sig governance treasury that is building this game. And there's 250 people working on it. The game's worth about six or seven billion dollars. It's one of the larger games in Ethereum. But you know, the point of that leading into kind of, you know, what does pounding the pavement look like? When we didn't know anything about games, you know, I spent a couple months in, you know, traveling around Europe, Asia, trying to figure out, you know, what the indie gaming landscape looked like and figuring out what the state of specifically the indie game studios were. And what we learned at that point was that you know, most of them were either going broke or selling their titles to major studios. There weren't really any monetization opportunities available in the free-to-play vein because those had just become so competitive. And all of them had this desire to go off and build a blockchain game because they were looking over the fence and realizing that, you know, there was just a ton of opportunity and just a new form factor for for kind of how they build. And so a lot of it is just, you know, parachuting into these traditional industries, seeing how blockchain can actually make a difference, and then working with the founders to develop a playbook. And and once you do that, and this is exactly what we did with DeFi, you have something that's repeatable. You have a beacon that you can put up and show people, you know, if you want to go do this, come and learn with us. And so that's a big part of it. A lot of it also is just spending 12 hours a day on a computer, looking at really fringe Twitter accounts to see what alpha that they have, to see what new ideas that they have, trying to tease out and read everything between super technical blockchain architecture documents to you know, how do you actually design a token economic scheme that makes your game grow in a sustainable way? Blockchain is really multidisciplinary and the research, you know, and the due diligence that you need to get to in order to be an effective investor reflects that. All right. So a couple of questions, because you've piqued my curiosity about the gaming industry and crypto. First of all, how do we think about what we mean when we talk about a crypto? Is there even a name for it? Like, is it Crypto gaming? Is it blockchain gaming? Is it Web3 gaming? GameFi was thrown out. I, th I think we're going to figure out something new that's a pretty bad name, but GameFi is, I think, what, what we'll temporarily call it. And what does that mean in practice? What does it mean for a game to have elements of crypto? Because obviously the entire game doesn't get rendered on a decentralized server. So what is the crypto component? And what would you say, because I have some thoughts about this just based on my own experience in the gaming industry, what would you say was the evolution of the gaming space since kind of online gaming that led us to a place where you think the opportunity now is for crypto to really take hold and add value in this industry? Let me take the first part and then Michael will, will take the second part. So the, the evolution and history of, of gaming, like let's let's go all the way back to you know putting discs into an Xbox. You know, the first type of games were you bought a cartridge, you bought a disc, you bought something that you could insert, and it cost around fifty to sixty dollars. And when free to play games came out, you know, you saw the same level of taboo that you see today with play to earn games where, you know, people said these aren't real games. You know, how could you do this where it's free to play and you can, you know, level up your your different characters if you play more. 
you know, Boom Beach, Machine Zone, you know, these all became kind of like bastardizations of this initial kind of console-based gaming, but eventually that became 75% of the market. And so you went from people having to pay to play to having people, you know, free to play, and they may, might earn some, you know, fictitious amount of, you know, jewels or, or whatever in the game. And now we're moving to the other side of the economic spectrum, which is people earning as they play. And I don't think it's going to be purely play to earn in the way that Axie does it. And for the people who don't know what Axie is, Axie is probably the largest crypto game by players today. There's about 2 million people who play it. And they're mostly farming the in-game currency, which is SLP. And you can earn 5 to $10 a day doing this. And in a world where there's 1.5 billion people that have an internet connection that make less than $5 a day, this has massive amounts of product market fit. And so we're moving from you know very extractive to the player to very accretive to the player, gaming modes, with free-to-play being in the middle. And it's very early days, but this is where it's going. Michael can speak to kind of the you know how games are built and, and things like that. Yeah, so so picking up where Vance left off, I, I think one of the concepts that we being in the DeFi space have had to change our minds on and the industry has had to change their minds on is the, the concept of complete decentralization or components of decentralization. And really games, you know, historically have built in, in a traditional manner of, you know, client server, whether the client is, you know, a console that you're connecting to a, a multiplayer service on, or whether it's your laptop or whether it's your phone, you know, the client has always been the thing that serves up the 4K 60 FPS view of the game that you're playing. And that I don't think is going to change. I think generally what we think about now is, you know, you've got client server moving to client server blockchain, where the client server is still serving up the majority of the gameplay itself. The blockchain, though, is where you have all of the marketplace elements, the economic elements, you know, the in-game currency, the NFTs that relate to characters that you're buying and selling and trading and interacting with. And, and it just adds a new layer to the entire game. And really what this enables, and, and taking it back to what Vance was describing and, and what we get really excited about is the concept of decentralization in the history of gaming actually should be a really powerful one in that historically with free-to-play games, the consolidation has been you know the overarching theme over the last 10 years because it takes tens of millions of dollars to build a game, but it takes tens of millions of dollars to market a game to break through, if not far more than that. And now what you have is this ability to build your own economy, build your own ecosystem to the point where you can have an indie developer with a thousand true players being able to originate a business model for your indie game that doesn't require you to sell the title to a, you know, a mid-tier publisher or a large company. And so I think you know, we're going to see the democratization of gaming actually enable this Cambrian explosion of new game developers who have historically been pushed aside. And, and frankly, you know, one of the things that we also follow histori- uh, more recently is with iPhones and Android phones, the IDFA, which is the ID for advertisers, has been removed to a large extent, which has eviscerated the advertising-based business model of most of these mobile-based gaming uh, games. And, and so that not only uh, forces indie and, and medium-sized developers to say, okay, blockchain is this new tech platform that I can go build my game on, but it's now the only tech platform that I can go build my game on, so I have to move over there. And so it's become not a feature, but actually a necessity. And so I think that's the large trend that we're seeing, and that's one of the reasons why we get really excited about you know Web3 Gaming or, or Game5, whatever we want to call it. So this is something I'm kind of vaguely familiar with, which is that there has been kind of like a controversy and uproar among gamers around crypto companies trying to come into the space or the monetization of digital wares or skins. I don't know if one, which tail is wagging which dog or whatever the, that, that right terminology is. How do the audiences differ and integrate here? So you've got like the traditional gaming audience and then you have people that play these types of games. Are they one and the same? Are they different? And how does that influence the mindset of developers who are developing games for crypto gaming audiences? Do they have to think about things differently besides just thinking about the tokenomics and the opportunities? Is it Are they serving different customers? Help me understand that. 
Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that Vance alluded to with Axie is that, you know, you have 2 million monthly active users. They're earning SLP. They're farming SLP. But this is very much SLP not, is the native token? SLP is the native token that you earn in the game and that you can spend in the game. And so when you're earning these tokens by farming them in the game, you can then go off and sell them to other players who want to go spend them to, in this case, breed cats. And that's effectively what the entire game is. And really, this is not a game of skill. It's not even really that engaging or entertaining from a graphical perspective as well. It's two dimensions. And the team at, at Sky Maven is working on new games, and, and those are in the hopper. But really, you know, the way that we see this industry maturing is twofold. One, there's going to be more games that are launching soon. Alluvium, as we spoke to, is one of those games that we backed. And there's a number of others that are launching in the next six to 12 months that will have the high fidelity and the, the entertainment value that you would expect from a console based or a PC-based game. And number two is that the game design itself is going to be an element of skill as opposed to an element of chance. And once you can have these two factors feature into the game of you know, something that's built on a blockchain, you add the element of the economy, and that just hypercharges this growth to the point where you're not just farming to dump, to sell, you're actually engaging, and the economy actually enhances the game. And so one of the things that we think about is you know, play to earn has been the model moniker that describes all of crypto-based gaming to date. But what we really think about in the future is that it's going to become play and earn, where you're playing because you want to play the game, you're competing at a high level. There's potentially even esports franchises, as we've seen with other games and other platforms. But you're also earning, and you're able to have the economic elements tie in, but it's supplementary. It's not core to what the game actually is. Yeah, I've watched a trailer for Alluvium. It's a completely... It looks like any other really high definition, awesome console game. And, you know, just hearing you talk about the place of gaming, I mean, it's a very compelling vision because, of course, gaming is such a popular way that people pass their time. I mean, even Gen Xers grew up with video games. It's not like something. I mean, I remember in the early 2000s when this was the first time that my generation understood that games weren't for kids anymore, right? Like the PS2 and the Xbox, that was a kind of transformational move away from the Nintendo and Sega that was much more like kids play. And now we're in a, it feels to me like we're in the next phase, right? We went from kids games to adult games with people ripping their heads off and like fatalities and Mortal Kombat to now you have people that are actually earning real world money in games. And we had that too with Second Life, most I think memorably. But of course that was Yes, I think there were some ways, but this was like, you know, early days where you had like the Linden Exchange and stuff, and it was it was not very liquid. It had limited currency pairs. Now, I presume these tokens are trading on on regular exchanges. And you can actually earn money and live a life just by playing these games, which is it's a whole nother revolution. How does this fit into the larger thesis that, you know, very popularly has the buzzword? of the metaverse, right? And it means all sorts of th different things to all sorts of different people. But how does this factor into that vision that we've heard so much about? That's a great segue. I think a lot of people believe that the metaverse, you know, what has been advertised to them at least is kind of like this VR universe where you can put on Oculus and go hang out with your grandmother. And that's certainly a very interesting use case for that technology, but I don't think that's what the metaverse really is at the end of the day. For us, the metaverse is simply you know, when you open your computer, how do you make money from it? You know, you can't go to Twitter, you can't go to Facebook, you can't go to Snapchat. There is no way to kind of, you know, have self-sovereignty and digital employment in today's Web2 paradigm. And so, you know, we're not focused on the VR, AR space. We think that crypto and specifically, you know, being able to build a game where, you know, a billion people can make a living wage, that is more likely to be the ground for the metaverse. And, and specifically because it's built on a blockchain, you have finance as a first principle, you have self-sovereignty, you have strong property rights. Those are the things which make building you know, a neo economy possible. And the things that are built on top of Axie, whether it be games or financial services or you know, different applications, it'll all come back to this concept of self-sovereignty and, and you know, some sort of universal employment that is able to be done on a blockchain. And for us, that's what the metaverse is about. It's being able to find employment on chain. And I think that is going to be the concept that stands the test of the time rather than anything that is more purely around you know, entertainment or games that are off chain. Because if you don't have that self-sovereignty, you lack a richness and depth of being able to develop an economy around it, 
which at the end of the day, that's what we think the metaverse is. It's an on-chain digital economy that employs hopefully everyone. You know, it's so interesting also hearing you talk, Vance, reflecting on what the early drivers of this industry have been and how those drivers have attracted capital to build out the infrastructure that will eventually lead to the types of opportunities that, let's say, quote, normies or mainstream folks can look at and say, oh, this makes sense. This is value add. You know, like DeFi was all speculation. Now here we're looking at gaming, but you're building out the foundations for what will come later. I want to talk about that a little bit more in the second part of our conversation, which we're going to transition to now. But I also want to make sure that we get a chance to talk about the application layer and your thesis about that and value accrual and how you think about tokenomics. Because as I said, it's at least for me, an area that I haven't come across the level of richness and rich exploration of ideas that I have on the base layer stuff and on the secondary layer solutions and even DeFi. Well, DeFi is really actually, that's it. That's what DeFi is. So much of it is tokenomics. So I, I want to ask you about that as well. And I also really do want to dig into your process, guys, because I think the one thing that anyone listening to this can relate to is how do I get in? How do I get into the next chain link? How do I get into the next big opportunity? You know, I'm curious to understand how someone listening to this can approach investing if it's even a fool's errand, given the fact that capital doesn't mean much anymore anyway. Now, we may be moving into a phase where capital becomes much more difficult to source. I think that's generally true. But of course, crypto still has its internal economics and fundraising capabilities. So there's something structural about the space that's long capital. It's not as short capital as the startup industry has traditionally been. But again, we're going to move all of that into the uh, second part of the conversation, guys. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second part of today's conversation with Michael and Vance, as well as the episode transcripts and intelligence reports, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Vance and Michael, stick around. We're going to move it to the second part of our conversation. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>